Hello and happy Thursday. Welcome again to another episode of Mid-American Gardener. I'm your host and Master Gardener in Training, Tanisha Shade Spain. This week we're going to answer some great questions sent in by you, our viewers, and we're going to take a look at some of our show and tells that are brought in by our expert panelists this evening. So to get started, we're going to have each of them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about their specialty. So Jim, we'll start with you. Hi, I'm Jim Angel. I'm the Illinois State Climatologist and I work at the Illinois State Water Survey at the Prairie Research Institute on the campus here at the University of Illinois. Wonderful. Hi, and I'm Shane Coulter. I'm one of the family owners of Country Arbor's Nursery and we're in Onarga and Urbana, Illinois. And we grow and sell all kinds of plants, everything from annuals, perennials, trees and shrubs. So I can answer anything in those lines. Wonderful. And Jim? And I'm Jim Appleby, an entomologist at the University of Illinois. I'm retired. But, so I deal with the insects and mites attacking trees, shrubs, and flowers. Wonderful. So we're spanning the gamut tonight with our experts this evening. And Jim, we're going to start down with you for our first round of show and tell. And right on time, because we're talking about frost, and it is chilly out there. That's right. <laughs> yes, it's chilly outside. So when you start thinking about frost, and the average frost dates in Illinois range from uh, early October in the northern part of the state to mid-October right here in central Illinois and then uh, late October in, this, in the southern part of the state. And typically we see frost in the, in the countryside before we see it in town because the town runs a little warmer than the countryside. Uh, you can mitigate it a little bit by covering up some things, but really it's pretty much the end of the season, so there's not much too much or more you can do about it. Uh, but we do have, uh, in many cases, frosted freeze advisories out uh, those are usually put out by the National Weather Service. So it's time to say goodbye to those flowers outside. That's, that's right. Now, uh, when you're getting those beds prepared, is there any advice that you can offer to folks to kind of get that ready? Yeah, so you, want, you can buy a little bit of time by covering things right now. Probably the best thing is, the other thing is you do is mulching at some stage here. In the fall, I usually like to clean things up a little bit, kind of get rid of the weeds and and trim back any of the perennials a little bit so it looks a little nicer outside anyway. Uh, but yeah, it's time to start wrapping things up. Wow, okay. Hard to believe that it's already come and to the... What's the difference between a freeze and a frost warning? What's the temperature you difference? You know, that's a good question. So freeze is 32 degrees, or, or frost is 32 degrees, and a freeze is 28 degrees. And 28 degrees really puts the kibosh on most uh, anything that's growing here in central Illinois. Okay, mm. all right, get ready for that this evening. All right, Shane, you've got some mums. Yeah, so this time of year is the, some, we sell thousands and thousands of mums. And the first question everybody asks is, is it gonna come back? So most garden mums will come back if you plant them sooner. So the regular mum you find in the chain stores, the garden centers uh, are, are hardy mums, but they're not quite as hardy as some other ones. So the sooner you get those in, the better chance you, you, they'll come back. Mm -hmm. But you also can go a different route, and this is a truly hardy mum. It used to be called chrysanthemum, then they changed it to leucanthemum, <laughs> then they changed it to dendranthemum, <laughs> and now they've changed it back to chrysanthemum. <laughs> so they should have just left it alone. <laughs> but it is a mum, and it will come back. I could probably leave this in the parking lot, come back next year, and it'll still be do, do just fine. And now it comes in all different kinds of colors. And this one is called Matchsticks, and it's one of the most popular and one of my favorite. It's got this beautiful bronze with the red fluted tips to it, mm -hmm. and it will come back. It'll get about three feet by three feet. You, we trim them down about June 1st. We trim them to the ground so they'd be a perfectly round mm -hmm. mum. And they'll bloom, I, we've had them bloom all the way up until December. So they can bloom a long time. They're just starting to bloom now, so they're a little later than some of your garden mums. But it really is a perfect perennial to get that fall color that they're looking for. Now, mm -hmm. if I, I know a lot of places sell them in the fall. Is that a good time to put them in if you want them to come back and be hardy each year? That's a great question. So something like this in a garden center like ours, we sell this year round. Okay. <clears throat> so you can buy this in May. Oh. And the garden mums, we actually sell them in May as well because of the reason we talked about earlier, getting them in sooner. Well, if you only offer them in August and mm -hmm. September, how can I get them in sooner? So we answer the question by growing some early so people can plant them in May and have that beautiful. But you have to cut them down in June otherwise they'll start blooming in August September way before you want them to so cutting them back and letting them start over each year is a great thing to do awesome. and it's uh, chrysanthemum there's lots of good colors hardy mum you'll want to ask for okay all right all right Jim what's, what's well this folks I think all of us all of us are interested in biological control and I think we ought to take advantage of some of our native insects as biological control agents 
And uh, the wasps are such a, an insect. I brought in the, the uh, nest of the bald-faced hornet. This is one that's, uh, that's pr pretty common throughout the entire Midwest, and they make these huge nests. And there'll be maybe a, thousands of, of, uh, of the wasps inside. Now, if you're interested in bringing in one of these and nests, you want to wait until we have the first really hard frost. I would say, Jim, what time would that be? Yeah, so it should probably be around here, probably more like in November before it oh, really yeah. gets hard, yeah, yeah. You know, those hard, uh, persistent cold weather. Because so if you bring it in too early, <laughs> what will happen is wasp will come out of this. Thing. So I'm thinking like <laughs> December 25th. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just to be sure. <laughs> later. All right. Anyway, uh, you, I, I really would urge all of you to uh, not destroy these wasps because they, they actually feed, they're actually a good biological control agent. They feed on small caterpillars. So the adults will go out and uh, get caterpillars and then bring it back to the nest and feed the uh, young uh, these caterpillars. So let's take advantage of the uh, wasps. So I would not destroy these things. Just uh, I, I'd have to say that the only, ad, only the female adult wasp will overwinter, the queen. Mm -hmm. All the others die, so she's only the one that overwinters. And she's generally found underneath loose bark or something like that. And then uh, in the spring, she'll go out and start the, the nest, and then they keep developing into more and more of the, of the wasp as, as she develops eggs, and the eggs hatch, and they get really big. Then another wasp that you often see, and you, I'm sure all of you are familiar with this, this is the uh, paper wasp. Mm -hmm. They often build their nest under the eaves of houses. Mm -hmm. And again, let's not destroy these unless you have to paint your house and then you, know, then you don't have any other choice, you know. And they do have some of these um, aerosol sprays that you can use to get rid of them. But in general, I would urge all of you to not let let the wasp go unless they're in a location where you might get stung. Mm -hmm. I just got stung about a week ago because I got too close to this one. <laughs> <laughs> We have a couple of those in our house, and they're my son's worst nightmare. He always is policing them to make sure. Yeah, that well, I think not you know. And get him. Most of the time, unless you, I had one a couple of years ago that was right near my front door, and I would be, you know, going in and out and slamming it, and never got stung. Hmm. You cohabitated. Well, you know, I'm an entomologist, so I, <laughs> you know how to do it. Though. That helps. All right, we're going to go to the phones. We've got Kathy on line two from Champaign with a question about ferns. Kathy, are you there? Kathy? Yes. Hi, Can you, you have a question? Me? Yes, go for it. Okay, all right. Um, I have some ferns that I have not planted yet. Um, there's two things. Um, the ferns have not been planted yet. Is it a bad time to plant them? And then I have an oak leaf hydrangea that's been supposed to have been moved to another location. Is it an okay time to relocate that? Yeah, I think the sooner you get it in, the better, especially the fern. I assume it's a hardy fern, so it was meant to be in the ground anyway. So, um, yeah, this is a perfect time to plant, mulch it in real well, water it in real well. And that'd be the same with the oak leaf hydrangea as far as time to move. I would have said when it was 80, you might wait a little while. Now that we've turned to a much colder temperature, things are about to start going dormant. So you're, you're right there. You might wait another week or two, but it's a good time to start moving plants. And um, again, you're gonna wanna mulch them in real well. Our winters have been so all over the board. Last year with no snow cover and not a lot of moisture, uh, things did not do as well during the winter. So maybe help out a little bit by watering them in and mulching them in real well, and you should be just fine. Okay. All right, we're going to go to Richard now with another transplanting question on line three. Richard, are you there? He just answered my question. He said you could start moving plants. Now, is it the same for trees? <laughs> I want to know about trees, though. Yeah, so are you, how are you going to move it? That's my question. I always, I'm always interested. As a guy that moves trees, I like to hear how other people move them. Are you going to move it by hand? Are you going to dig a hole? Are you going to... Yeah, well... I can tell you though, this is a good time. We just started harvesting trees and digging trees today. It was just once the weather turned, you're gonna start seeing some good fall color on your trees starting to come around. The, the, uh, it's gonna be cooler and the moisture is gonna hold a little better now that it's uh, not getting so hot. So 
time to move that tree. The other time would be March. Uh, October, November is a good time to move, and March is the other time to move a tree. So okay. there are a couple varieties of trees, and I won't be able to, on the show to go over them, but there are some trees that don't move well during red buds, don't move well during the fall. Uh, a lot of your nut trees are not very good mm -hmm. to move during the fall. So there's some that you'd rather wait till spring, mm -hmm. uh, and you can always call the nursery or a local extension will know what that is, I would think. Okay. All right, we're going to take another call on line four. We've got Lois and Rantoul with a question about orange cider. Lois, are you there? Yes, I am. Go for it. Okay, I brought one of my flowers in because I want to save it, and I noticed there was some webbing, like a spider web on it, and I turned the leaf over, and I found a big, well, a, a orange uh, spider oh, with spider. black and orange um legs and he's got a little bit of spots on the back and i wonder what it is well that word switched from cider to spider <laughs> I, had, I had the cider <laughs> question <laughs> covered but I'm, gonna, <laughs> so I'm gonna let you get the, the spider one i'm not exactly sure what's uh, the name of that particular spider there's so many different kinds of spiders but i would just say protected because it's again a biological control agent that you want to have around so in the house Oh, is it in the house? She brought it in. Yes, <laughs> oh, okay, well, I, I think I put it outside. Yeah. <laughs> I should put Let it outside. Go. Good. Yeah. Okay. You uh, did a good right. thing. I just wondered if it was poisonous or not. No, I, no, no, it, it's not. Okay. All right. So back around to the second round of questions. Jim, we're going to go with you. You've got a rain gauge to share. That's right. I've got a rain gauge here. This is the Cadillac of rain gauges. <laughs> And it's uh, one we use in one of our volunteer networks called Coco Rise. And it's uh, <laughs> built to handle up to 12 inches of rain. So it's got an inner tube with nice big markings. When your eyes get older, it's easier to see those nice markings. And so it's a very good rain gauge to have out there. And if you are a gardener, it's good to have a rain gauge. And the bigger, the better. You know, sometimes they give away those freebies that are about three inches tall <laughs> and about an inch wide. And, those really aren't very useful, but if you get a good rain gauge, you can track your rainfall to see if you're ahead or behind on rainfall. In Illinois, our average rainfall ranges from about 48 inches in southern Illinois to about 40 inches in this part of the state, and then up to about only up to about 36 inches in far northern Illinois. So I get a big range in the, the rainfall, but we're a pretty wet state for the most part. Now, how did this year shape up? I know. Go yeah, ahead. so this year we're pr we, we've had caught up uh, pretty much. In fact, we're running a little bit ahead of, of the game right now in this area. There were a few dry spots in Illinois this year in western Illinois and up around Kankakee, but by and large it was a very wet year for most of us. I think I mowed the grass about every week this year, so yeah. the grass never did slow down for this year. It's funny that one of the driest in this area was May, which mm -hmm. on on paper, it looks like it was normal because it all came on the last day of the month. Yeah. We got five <laughs> or six inches in that yep. one big rain, so everybody said, well, it was a normal month. It wasn't, yeah. it was super dry. So the numbers don't always tell the true story. That is but true. But our grass does. Yes. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. Right. Okay, well Shane, we've got a question for you. All right, this well, is, I've, oh, yeah, go I've go got it. a question from uh, Lovington, Indiana, mm -hmm. so it's nice to see it from a different state. Uh, it's kind of a humble brag, as we call it. It's a really nice system he set up. He's got a, a Carpathian English walnut, and um, David Jackson loves this walnut, but he has problems with the squirrels also loving it. So he's come up with a way to keep the squirrels off of it by wrapping a piece of vinyl around that uh, trunk so that the squirrels can't climb up, which I think that's, you know, the, what you want is to make it difficult. And you see all the videos of the launchers and all the different things to try and keep <laughs> these squirrels off. And a piece of PVC and a piece of vinyl wrapped around the trunk so they can't ever get a grip. And you also see it sometimes in the parks where they put the piece of metal. If everybody, anybody ever wonders why they have these metal, uh, slippery piece of metal, that's so the squirrels can't climb the tree. So, David, you had a really good idea. Uh, it's a piece of vinyl cost almost nothing, so you can just put it around the tree and uh, keep those squirrels off of it. Much better than some expensive little And apparently they're, it's far enough away that they can't jump from one tree to another. Well, huh? I didn't want to ruin it for him <laughs> <laughs> because he's pretty excited about it. So, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, if there's anything close to get over that. Oh, um, yeah. But you can always go a little higher. But no, that that's it. Squirrels, 
are pretty much smarter than us, we've realized over the years. <laughs> oh, they'll, yes. they'll overcome it. But for the time being, he's getting lots of walnuts. So let's, <laughs> let's let him enjoy it. It's working it. for him. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Right exactly. Okay. All right. Uh, we've got a question for you. This is from Paul in Peoria. He says he's been trying to grow a giant pumpkin. The biggest issue he's had is the cucumber vine borer. The plant starts drooping, and soon after, there's an orange goo on the vine. How do I deal with those pests? Well, I think you're having the problem with the squash vine borer, squash vine borer. And, uh, you know, it, it's a real pest on squash, pumpkins, zucchini, and uh, if you don't control it, it will kill the vine. So the best time to control that particular pest is when the pumpkin or zucchini is just starting to vine out. And that's generally about the early June. And if you use an insecticide like Seven and uh, use it as a spray or a dust and apply that to around the time, maybe about probably in, in central Illinois, it'd be around the 1st of June. And when the plant starts vining, and then all you'd have to do is put that material on, and then about 10 or 12 days later, put a second application on. And you want to do that in the evening hours because. Uh, as you probably know, squash and pumpkin flowers start, they only, are only good for one day. So if you put it on early in the morning, you, you may be killing off some of the pollinating insects, some of the bees and flies that may pollinate. So do it after the evening hours and apply that. And I think that would do a good job. Now, once the insect is in the vine, you can actually cut it out. Uh, I've done that myself on zucchini. If you see, that frass coming out of a little area and the, the uh, leaf may well a little bit, you just take a very sharp knife and make a slit along the uh, vine and find the grub, take it out, and then take maybe a, a, like a rubber band or maybe even a, a, a band that you put on your, you know, your skin. Like a Band-Aid? A Band-Aid oh, wow. and wrap that up and then, then it will uh, dry out and uh, you'll see the plant that way. That's like surgery. It is. Yeah. Yeah. Surgery. Yeah. <laughs> okay, we're gonna go back to the phones. We've got Martha on line two. She has a question about when to prove oak leaf hydrangea. Martha, are you there? Yes, I am. I'd like to know uh, a, a how, when to prune a couple of things. The first is an oak leaf hydrangea. All right, that's, uh, <clears throat> that's an easy one. Uh, for the rule, generally across the board on plants, the best time to always prune is after they flower. And so oak leaf would fit into that category. Now, you know, they have a beautiful dried flower. I think that they're pretty. You can leave that on all winter and prune early spring, or you can prune it off now if you want to. If you don't enjoy the dried flowers, you can trim those off now. And, uh, and, and then in the spring, it'll start its reflowering and setting buds again. But the time you want to do it is either, either now or at the beginning of March, April, right, right before it's starting to leaf or right, when it's, uh, right after it's starting to put on a couple leaves. So you just want to get it before it's in flowering stage, and that's over the next five months. Okay. Then you said you had a question. Another one? True for limelight hydrangea also. That's the same with limelight hydrangea. And that's essentially true for any of those uh, Quercifolia, those um, oak leaf hydrangeas. They're all the same type. Uh, the round type flowers you can almost take off any time because a lot of them re keep reproducing. And then the pointy flowers, uh, which are the not uh, oak leaves, you, same thing. You trim them off when you don't enjoy the flowers anymore. Take them off. All right, next call, Tim on line three from Bloomington with a question about a green spider. Tim, are you there? Yes, ma'am. Go for it. I've seen a bright lime green colored spider. Never seen one before. Just wondering if you've ever seen one and what it was. <laughs> like I said, there's so many different kinds of spiders that um, I'm afraid I don't, I know, I do not know the common name of that one. I have seen a couple of those, but uh, I'm afraid I, I can't help you as far as the name is concerned. If you see it again, snap a picture of it. <laughs> yeah, pictures are always the, yes, the best part. Yes, they'll always help. Okay, back to round three on questions. Jim, we're going to go to you. Kathy in Charleston has an unhappy nine bark. It's about 20 years old, and it gets four to six hours of sun a day. Will it do any good to trim it back? And if so, when should I do it? 
Yeah, so I've had a similar situation myself. We have a, a nine bark in our backyard that gets about the same amount of sunlight, about the same vintage. And so what we did is we actually, in the winter time, I cut it all the way back. And so it regrew and it actually came back pretty vigorously. I was surprised. It, it had gotten tall and, and lanky. And by doing that, it kind of re revitalized it. So it's a much better shrub now. Okay, all right, Shane, you've got a question about peach tree bark. Yeah, so I, this one was a little bit difficult, but, but peaches can be sometime. Um, David Jackson, oh, this is the same person yes. we had last time. All right. <laughs> well, this time he's got a peach tree, uh, a Reliance peach tree problem. It's not thriving. It's a, it's a first year plant and there's been some bark damage on it. Uh, and looking at the pictures, the first thing I thought was, I thought it was rubbing the stake. This is something that people do when they stake a tree. Rather than do kind of a three-point stake, they'll put a, a square pole next to it. You should always use a round, smooth pole if you're going to put a stake next to it. I prefer the guy method, but if you are going to put a stake, make sure it's round because the square edges catch that tree every time the wind blows and it can cause damage. I thought that's what it was and he had moved the stake, but then looking again, we thought maybe it was a peach borer. But a peach borer generally has the flaking bark on top and then when that peels away, then you can kind of start seeing the holes. That doesn't look like it. So the, the only thing I can come up with is it's gotten some kind of damage. Rodents, uh, rodents, rabbits love to eat fruit trees. And even if it's not a true edible fruit, if it was in that family, uh, crab trees, anything that berries, during the winter, if there's a snowfall or they get really hungry, they will eat the bark. So anything that's in the fruit family, you wanna make sure that you cover it up. And if you get damaged like this, don't use tar, don't use all these different things to try and uh, cover it up. That's like putting butter on a wound. We just don't do that anymore. The tree will heal naturally. Jim always talks about letting bugs get in there. He gets mad at when I say, just leave it alone. It's gonna, uh, it's gonna heal itself. So you definitely wanna watch for bugs and definitely wrap it with a nice paper wrap during the winter to prevent this during the winter. I always get upset. I know. You, so we do or we don't want bugs getting Well, that's in there. what we argue about every day. Ooh. If there's, I can't figure out when he wants now, them and when he doesn't. Take? What's your take on the insects getting in? Well, they, they will do that, so it's probably better to put some type of spray on there. Okay, yeah. so it's not beneficial running. for them to get in. Yeah, it's not beneficial. Gotcha. But eventually the tree will sap up and mm -hmm. get hard yeah. enough, but it is easier to get in once it doesn't have bark, gotcha. undoubtedly. Mm -hmm. Gotcha. Okay. All right, Jim, we've got some questions for you. Um, Marilyn has a question about grubs. During grub season, this grossed me out when I read it, my dogs love to find grubs and cicadas. What can I use to get rid of the larva and deter my dogs from eating them? <laughs> well, I, I think I would go with a uh, commercial for, for commercial operation and see if they would be able to spray their, their lawn. Okay. Um, there are several insecticides that they could use, but a lot of those are restricted just to the, um, you know, the absolutely operator. Mm -hmm. So I've never heard of dogs trying to eat grubs. Our dog did that. We had a really? beagle mix, and every time we dug something up or, or planted something, she'd be in there looking for oh grubs and would eat them. And uh, wow, uh, what about milky spore? How do you what do you feel you about know, milky that, spore? I I don't think that's very good. The you don't use, think it's very effective? No, I don't think it's very effective. Uh, I really think I'd go with the commercial operator and see if they could spray yeah. your lawn. Yeah. There's plenty of applications that you can put on that the commercial yeah. guys can get rid of it really quickly. Yeah. Okay, all right. Yeah. Um, and then we've got a, an insect ID. You're the popular one. Uh, perhaps one of your entomology experts can an identify this bug that attached itself to the ceiling of our porch. Even the exterminator could not identify it. Do we have that picture by chance? Have you seen the picture? I did see the picture. Uh, you know, it was such a far away <laughs> shot that I, I really can't you tell. You couldn't tell. So maybe you, the maybe you could uh, take another shot of that <laughs> much closer, and we could. That's the bug. That's it. Looks like a mummy standing upside down. Yeah, I, 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 we need a closer view of that. I think. <laughs> All uh, right, Debbie, get in there and get us a closer shot, and send it back in and. Yeah. And Jim will take another crack at it. So um, more on winterizing. Um, let's tell folks anything else that you guys can think of. I know last week I was asking about oats, putting oats um, as a cover crop. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, we, we use it. We, we use that maybe in areas that, uh, that we're going to trample on. So we only use cover crops on things that are muddy in that area. 
and then but we don't use too many cover crops but I, I do have a really good tip that okay. people because it's going to save us a thousand questions next year hydrangeas that don't bloom are caused <laughs> because they don't have any old wood from last year so how do you get the old wood to make it over the winter we use right now starting soon we're going to use compost and we volcano it up so we use mm -hmm. mulch and compost and we cover six or eight inches of that that hydrangea um, the round flowered hydrangeas uh, and we cover it up and that seems to protect it enough so you get about six or eight inches of of last year's plant mm -hmm. and that will bloom next year oh, if okay. you don't do that we could get a hard winter it dies to the ground mm -hmm. and we're back to the questions we got 72 more questions yes. of asking why yes. it doesn't yeah. bloom yeah, why? <laughs> so now is the time to think about protecting your hydrangeas for next year okay and as we're ripping everything out don't throw it away put yeah. it in your compost pile it's free compost yeah, for, and watch know. what it is because all these funguses, I spent 700 hours answering questions about fungus on leaves. That fungus is on the leaf, and if you leave it underneath the tree, every time it rains next year, it's just going to splash back up. Get rid of all those leaves that were there. We get to start new next year. Everything is fresh and brand new. All those problems and things, they're, they're, they're going to be gone. gone. They're going to be in the trash. <laughs> okay, all right. Thanks so much for watching. We'll see you next week. Make sure you find us on all of our socials and look out for our podcast. Good night.